Dr. Moulton, before you throw us out. I, I thought that was a very interesting exchange. Now, just from the sidelines, um, we've been speaking about rationalizations of, 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 of riders, um, but I think I'm hearing also an echo of a, 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 a rationalization from the sports administrator side. Yeah. Are you saying, in effect, in that exchange with Floyd, that because he lied in that particular forum, the fact that the lab assistants lied uh, about the standard operating procedure doesn't count? So or, I think no. that, I, I, or are I to that the fact that Michael Rasmussen might have lied about his whereabouts is important, but the fact that the, the administrator didn't follow the rules is not important. It's a, another side to that. No, I, I don't think I'm saying that. I'm not saying the ends justifies the means. I'm saying that uh, bodies like Kaz and uh, AA have to decide on the balance of probabilities. And uh, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I think that's what they did, and I think they got it right. Well, they don't decide on the balance of probabilities. It's a much higher standard, but anyway. Can I, can I just make a point? Yep, last one. In uh, 2008, about a month before the uh, Track World Championship, so, uh, there was a British cyclist, a British track cyclist, who went over the 50 Matacrit. Now, he was a, uh, he'd been on the biggest French uh, Division One team in about 2000, 2001. So a lot of people here all know who I mean. I won't name his name. But he went over 50 crit, and uh, you hear from your national coach, Brailsford, and your... Uh, and the UK of British cycling, uh, and he supposedly only uh, when he was dehydrated and he was sick. Now, that was the spin put out, and I appreciate that he's not going to get a band, and he can't before a process is undertaken, but this is all Professor Muller was uh, suggesting, you follow that process, and your rider um, was availed himself of that process and he wasn't suspended, and if you have a look at the balance of prob probabilities on that, going over there a 50% crit, there'll be an entire uh, longitudinal uh, numbers of his crit over the last 10 years since he was at that major French team. And you ask a haematologist about the percentage chance of him going over, naturally Dr. Ashenden can say here uh, what the percentage chance of him going over that national, uh, and he, that guy wanted to make the Beijing Olympics. So, so uh, I, think, I think it's very difficult for you to say, uh, stand here and criticise Dr Muller when it was British cycling in 2008, did something very similar and you followed the processes and um, that rider was never sanctioned. Well, that's not actually correct. And uh, <laughs> well, first of all, let me say that I'm not saying that uh, British cycling is morally superior to any other nation's cycling. And, I'm sure that we have uh, our problems uh, and uh, have had them in the past and will have them in the future. Uh, in the case of the, uh, the guy I mentioned there, uh, I'm very familiar with that case. Uh, that rider was in effect sanctioned in that the whereabouts, uh, not the whereabouts, the no start system uh, did, did apply and he didn't take part in those world championships and, uh, and did, uh, was in effect sanctioned in, in that process. I, I, yeah, 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 the 10-day sanction, yeah, yeah, which was applicable to that finding, which was that he, he had a hematocrit, which was over the limit, which was the, those rules at, at that time. My understanding is that that particular case was one of the reasons why the no-start uh, system was abandoned as being an unsatisfactory way of judging whether a rider was doping or not, because that rider was not doping and had genuinely uh, reasons why his hematocrit was higher than 50%, as many other riders did, as was uh, referred to by uh, Professor Ashington. Okay. That looks like it's a guy. Um, I think in winding up, the one thing I should say um, is that something that I said at the beginning, that the, these things uh, it's never the right time to talk about these things. It's never the right time to talk about the, the past and the problems that the past has thrown at us. But what, and when we have raised problems that currently exist or have existed in the past, we haven't done it in a way or, um, in order just to focus on the past and run down and talk about how bad things are. 
the point that we made at the beginning of all of this and the point that we, when we talked about the report, and it would have been nice if some people who wanted to do a quick media grab came for the report and everything as well, was that we need to understand the past in order to create a better future. And if we cannot bring up issues such as bodies not following rules, the way that the riders feel, the, the way that the system's currently administered and the lack of faith that a number of people seem to have in it, we're never going to be able to move forward. And this was really, you know, the really strongly put, I think, by the rider, rider statement that I read out at the beginning of this session. So we're not, none of us are here and none of us exist in order to destroy cycling. We're all here to try and make, we all love cycling so much. We're all here to make it a better place and a better sport. And I suppose the great disappointment that we've all had is expressed by Andy and why I greeted you when you first spoke is that we have been trying to invite people like the UCI, Cycling Australia and others for 18 months we've been talking to them about this con conference and they threw everything at us in the last couple of months to try and stop the discussion. But we're here and we're going to keep talking and hopefully by us talking, other people will be encouraged to think about the sport and the problems and how we can do things better. And, um, and that's, that's the sort of spirit that we want to carry on with in the future. Thanks for all coming. Um, I hope it's been interesting. I hope it's been valuable. I hope that we can continue or start to work together in the future. And I think Floyd's presence here, the way that I've seen him work with, with Michael, the way I've seen him talking to so many other people here involved in anti-doping, it's broken down a lot of barriers. The other thing is, I think the whole last few weeks and the hysteria about this conference could have been handled so much, in a much better way by the authorities. They could have dealt with it. They could have understand what we were trying to say to them weeks ago. We haven't created any bad press. We haven't sought to create any bad press. So let's just get on and work together. Thanks for coming. Can I just say on behalf of the audience, thank you very much, uh, Martin, and thank you, Michael Trapper. Dr. Ashton, thank you, Floyd. Thank you, Professor Muller. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Botsy. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Setsi. And